And tonight's uh, session is the electric grid and the energy pa uh, transition panel discussion with Janelle Bourgeois, um, Ann Rhodes, and Guillermo Metz. And I think I'm just going to hand it off uh, to them right now. So go ahead and take it away. Great. Thank you. Um, maybe brief introductions, tell people where we're coming from and kind of you know, what our professional environment is um Don, so you wanna janelle start, you want to start the recording it oh, is recording uh, it's oh, live on it's youtube paused. so we're oh it says paused on yeah, my screen yeah, the, okay the zoom recording is paused but we're live on youtube so. <laughs> okay uh yeah janelle if you want to start off sure hi everyone um i'm janelle i'm a lead analyst with the smart grids innovation and planning team at NYSEG. i've been with the company just about five years now I started off actually as a customer service representative in the call center, did that for about two and a half years. And then I moved into a role with our operations team as the construction scheduler for the Geneva division. And I stepped into this role about six months ago. So I'm excited to be here and get to talk to everybody. Thanks. Um, and you're going to kick off the whole presentation. So let me go next and then you can lead us off. Um, so I, uh, in Guillermo Metz, I run what's called the Energy and Climate Change Team at Cornell Cooperative Extension in Tompkins County. And we do all kinds of programs, essentially giving people information about how to reduce their energy use and get off of fossil fuels is is mainly what, what our work is centered around. Anne? Great. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm Ann Rhodes. I work for Cornell Cooperative Extension downtown. Uh, as an energy educator, and I do a lot of work in various parts of the community to try to raise people's awareness about the climate crisis and what they can do to mitigate it and adapt to the what's what's definitely coming for our future. Um, so this session tonight is about the electric grid, and I'm going to start off with just a very basic sketch of of what the what the grid is and uh, what the parts of it are and how it, how it works. So electricity is produced um, at various power plants. Here you can see my little sketch of coal or gas plants um, in upstate New York. And that power is sold to NYSEG, which is the company that delivers the electricity to us. And the grids, uh, are separate across the whole country. So our upstate grid um, here in New York is separate from the downstate grid and the two, the New York grids are separate from the grids in other parts of the countries. So we're pretty self-sufficient, most of us, although the, the grids can buy and sell energy from each other as needed. Um, so we, we mostly generate our own energy, our own electricity upstate um, through hydro, nuclear, wind, and solar. And that electricity is gathered into those big, huge power monster lines that you see marching um, across the landscape. Um, they're carrying the electricity to different regions of upstate. These are high voltage lines and eventually the voltage is stepped down and carried by the more familiar telephone poles. Although why we still call them telephone poles, I have no idea because they have nothing to do with telephones anymore. Um, and those telephone poles or utility poles, which line our roads, um, the voltage in that is stepped down again and the wires connect to our homes and businesses. So until recently, all the power in the lines was brought, bought by NYSEG from those big power plants and delivered to us. And NYSEG knew exactly how much power to buy because it knows how much power we're using. And that's measured by the little um, meter electric meter on the side of the house that so you can see where the wires are going in there. Um, but then, and we all started to get solar panels. And suddenly 
the power was flowing in both directions. And we were generating power from our panels and sending it back onto the grid and the electricity was moving in two directions. So maybe you can imagine the challenges that that posed for a nice egg. When they were used to just buying it and spreading it out to us, and suddenly we're producing it too and sending it back to them. It makes everything more complicated for a nice egg. They still need to estimate how much um, power that they need to buy, but they have to balance that against how much we're generating. And what we're generating um, changes with the weather and the time of day. And it's variable as Ingrid mentioned earlier. So it gets way more complicated. The math gets way more complicated. And over time, large solar farms were built across upstate New York and also wind farms, although that looks more like a flower than a wind turbine. <laughs> and more uh, renewable energy was fed into NYSEG, was sold to NYSEG to put onto the grid. Um, this added the problem of variability because the sun's not always shining and the wind's not always blowing. So they have to figure out how much energy, how much electricity do we need to buy from the non-renewable? Like hydro is 100%, it's like ongoing. They can count on it, nuclear is ongoing, but solar and wind are variable. So that made it more complicated because the production of electricity was, was uneven. Also, um, we ramped up our electrification, installing heat pumps in our homes and using EVs and um, both air source and ground source heat pumps were requiring more electricity than NYSEG was used to delivering to us. So the amount that was needing to come through the grid to our homes increased a lot. And so the infrastructure needed to be upgraded and the capacity needed to be increased. So um, what's to be done? That gives you a brief overview of what the grid is. If you have any questions, I'd be, I'd be happy to answer them now. Any questions for Ann? I have a few questions. <laughs> um, you mentioned that you know there's more demand for electricity as we brought on EVs and heat pumps, but um, how does that compare to what people think demand will be in say in the next five, 10 years? Because my, my guess is that it's gonna just keep increasing very rapidly. Um, is, that, is that what's being projected? Oh, well, um... Janelle will address this more specifically later, but uh, the amount of renewable energy that we can feasibly ramp up onto the grid is not going to be su uh, sufficient if we keep ramping up the amount of electricity that we're using. So besides um, switching to all electric and all electric renewables, we also have to reduce the amount of energy we're using significantly, individually as a household, and also collectively um, as a community. We're gonna to need to reduce the amount that we're using. I'd Mary. like to ask a question. Uh, I live up in the Adirondacks, so my energy comes from National Grid rather from NYSEG. Um, I can check on the amount of power that my panels are generating daily if I want, or weekly, or what have you, um, with a Bluetooth um, interaction with the mechanisms on the panel. I presume if I can do that, the power company can too, and look to see how much the panels are generating. So wouldn't that give them an idea of what- They're, they're not directly connected to your panels to read the, um, the output, but they can tell from reading the meter the electric meter attached to your house, how much is 
going in and how much you're using. So yes, they do have an S, sometimes it's an estimate, sometimes it's actual, although they are gonna install smart meters. And so then it'll be, they'll have continual information and Janelle will address that later too. So yes, they, they can tell what's being generated um, through the meter that they have installed. Good, thank you. Yeah, Ingrid, I see your hand up. Yeah, just a second question. I've heard the terms transmission grid and distribution grid. Can you explain the difference between those? Janelle, you want to take that? Sure, yeah. So the, the transmission grid is really the, the high voltage um, energy that's coming directly from the generation source. So as Anne had mentioned, like the coal-fired or gas power plants. And so that's moving that energy across the state, really, to the different regions. And then in those regions, it'll hit like a substation and that will step down the voltage. So it will lower the voltage so it can actually like be used in a house. Um, and that's what the distribution system is. It's moving that lower voltage energy to your house. And then once it gets there, it's going to hit another transformer. So like the big circle things you see up on the power lines, it's going to hit one of those and it's going to step it down further. So it's going to lower the voltage further so that it can be used in your appliances or to turn on your lights, that sort of stuff. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. If no okay. other questions, we'll keep going. Yeah. Um, and there'll be plenty of time at the end for uh, uh, questions once we wrap up. Um, so I want to cover just quickly the CLCPA target. So this is the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act that many of you probably have heard of. Uh, this is the what's being touted as the nation-leading climate goals for the state of New York. Um, rolled out about a year ago, but these, then there was a scoping plan that was finally approved at the beginning of this year that actually puts this into how we're going to get there. So these are the goals that were, these are regulations. These are not just goals. These are mandates that the state of New York has passed. So 70% of the state's electricity must come from renewable energy by 2030 and 100% by 2040. And emissions free will include nuclear. So nuclear, solar, wind, hydro. Um, 9,000 megawatts of offshore wind must be installed to serve New Yorkers by 2035. That's the goal. Um, how, you know, so within that 70% of the, the state's electricity, we're also meeting residential, commercial uh, customers with direct energy. So 6,000 megawatts of solar energy. These are the solar farms we're talking about across the state, more than the rooftop solar that Anne put in her diagram. So you might have heard of these um, community distributed generation or solar farms that are going in across the state. Um, that's what this is addressing. And we'll talk a bit more about those in a little bit. There's a statewide goal of reducing energy consumption, as Anne referred to. That's going to be really critical, not just everyone's sort of you know business as usual. And we're going to just add a bunch of renewables, but reducing energy use overall is really important. There's a lot of inefficiencies. Uh, particularly in the residential sector. Um, 3,000 megawatts of energy storage capacity, so battery storage uh, before those times when the wind isn't blowing and the, the sun isn't shining. And a critical piece of the entire C CLCPA mandate is that 35% minimum of the benefits must accrue to disadvantaged communities with a goal of 40%. And there are clearly defined disadvantaged communities across the state. And we can share that map if people are interested in seeing that. Um, any questions about CLCPA or, or what this means even? Um, happy to take, you know, like I said, clarifying questions now, or we can wait till the end to, to address bigger questions. Um, we'll just go on, Janelle. Okay, so, as Guillermo kind of outlined, the CLCPA sets really bold and ambitious green energy goals for New York State. And obviously with those kinds of goals, there are a lot of challenges to achieving them. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about three of them and how NYSEG and Avangrid, um, as the one of the region's utilities are responding. So broadly, 
I would say that the challenges I'm going to cover fall into three categories, um, infrastructure, innovation, and integration. For the infrastructure challenge, from a bird's eye point of view of the entire state, as a diagram on the right there shows, there's a real abundance of clean energy being produced upstate and a huge need for clean energy downstate to, release the, to reduce the reliance on things like peak or power plants. And there are multiple ongoing projects to create transmission infrastructure to move energy across the state. And on a smaller scale um, in this region, a similar challenge exists. How can clean energy that's being produced be moved around the distribution system um, effectively? And the second challenge um, outlined in the CLCPA, and as Anne had talked about, um, is that even after all existing clean energy technologies are deployed, there's still a remaining need for 15 to 45 gigawatts of clean energy generation to meet the 2040 goals. And that's what the chart on the left is showing. And so that's a question of how can innovative technologies be developed to address that gap? And if we could go to the next slide. Yeah, so for the last challenge, um, that's a challenge of integrating those resources onto the grid. And Anne talked about this a little bit. Um, adding renewable energy is very complicated for power system operators. The electric grid was designed to rely on large scale generators, producing a regular and predictable amount of electricity. So power system operators could continuously balance this supply against customer side demand. But many renewable energy sources such as solar and wind power, you know, they wax and wane depending on the time of day, the season, the region. So this challenges power system operators to anticipate complex shifts in supply against demand. New technologies um, such as energy storage, battery technologies, and advanced software and algorithms to support the integration of clean energy are needed to create a smarter grid that will have the flexibility, agility, and adaptability to, to handle the, the growth of clean energy. So the question here is how can renewable energies be integrated into the grid in a way that benefits all customers while also improving system reliance and reliability? So just to sum up, you know, the three challenges that you know, I see and want to talk about from the utility perspective are how to build that infrastructure, how to innovate those technologies, and how to integrate those resources. I don't know if anyone has any questions about that. I have a question. Sure. Sorry, I don't want to dominate, but I have so many questions about this topic. You're fine. Um, are there are there other places in the country or around the world that have figured this out or sort of ahead of us in figuring out how to deal with all these complexities and the, that are good models for us? Sure. I think that at least New York State and particularly in the Ithaca region is really at the forefront of doing some of these things. Um, so I think that in a lot of ways, we might end up being the model. And I, I have a question that I've wondered about for a while, but didn't know who to ask. And I know that- I'll do my best. <laughs> well, I know that uh, municipalities that don't have electrified mass transit, one of their biggest elect, uh, uh, electric power uses is pumping water for <laughs> municipalities water. And I wondered, can't we just fill more water towers when we've got excess electricity? And because, you know, it takes a lot of electricity to move water around. So it seems like at least some of that excess could just, you know, fill the water towers when there's excess. And, and, uh, and would that work? <laughs> I guess is my, my question. I mean, it sounds like a good idea. It's kind of outside my area of expertise, but I could I could try and ask around here and find out. I'm sure there's at least someone in engineering that that would have a better good grasp on that than me. I'll just throw in there that I mean, there are a lot of you're basically talking about a way to use energy when you have it and store it and and um, 
you're not talking about pumped storage, pumped hydro, and you're talking about just filling a water tank when you should have more power or when you have more power than you need. But there are a lot of batteries that people are talking about that uh, you know involve all kinds of pretty ancient technologies. You know, sometimes you know the, the ancient Romans basically pumped water up um, uphill and then let it flow down, and we can do that with you know with electricity now that they couldn't do it back then. But um, so there are these sort of battery storage systems that are not just lithium ion that people are talking about, you know, employing in different areas where it makes sense. So here in Ithaca, and I know a lot of people on the call are across the state, but even here in Ithaca, we are, you know, there are talks about, because we're a hilly community, you could pump hydro up when you have the power, let it flow down, turn some turbines or something to create electricity when you don't have it. And so th there are systems that you could employ there's ways to use that power when you have it rather than just sort of you know letting it go to waste um yeah i know i, I don't i haven't heard anything about this in a few years but i know there was a to be a test project in lake ontario off of toronto of filling big balloons with air <laughs> with excess uh um, energy and uh you know letting the lake uh, compress them when uh, they needed the power again. But that it's pretty amazing. Some of these technologies are like pretty uh, not technological. It seems yeah, right? <laughs> they're pretty basic. Yeah, it's pretty impressive. Um, but the, 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 I think the variety of options <clears throat> is exciting. There's a lot of different sort of these big scale battery options and they're going to be all needed. Um, all right, let's let's keep going. So um, as people have referred to, there is this sort of upstate versus downstate grid. And I'm just going to focus on the upstate grid where we are here in Ithaca. And I know, again, a lot of people are joining us from across the state. But um, and we can look at the downstate grid separately if you want. But the upstate grid is essentially uh, we can look at a map of it also. But, um, you know, everything from Westchester North. Um, is a very very clean mix of electricity actually so over you know the colors are essentially looking at the orange is gas so we do have quite a bit of gas but we also have a large amount of nuclear more than the national average and a much larger um, percentage of hydro than the national average so other areas in the country have quite a lot of hydro but the national average is pretty small we get a lot of hydro from quebec from Niagara, from you know the the you know the, the northern area around the um, around the Great Lakes and around um, Niagara Falls, uh, solar is tiny up there. Uh, biomass is tiny, and wind is a bit larger. But this mix is actually one of the cleanest grids in the country. So if you just looked at carbon dioxide emissions, we are. Uh, purportedly the cleanest grid in the country, actually, um, in upstate New York. So what I infer from that is that we get a lot of questions about what if we electrify everything? Basically, we're just running off of dirty electricity off of power plants. So if we electrify everything, that's terrible. We're just you know adding more dirty electricity. But in fact, upstate at least, it's quite clean electricity. So compared to burning fossil fuels at your home, compared to burning gasoline in your car, it actually is much, much cleaner to electrify everything today and connect to the grid. Um, this is not whether you have solar panels on your roof. This is not whether you buy into a solar farm. This is just the, the electric grid as it stands. Um, and it's getting cleaner all the time, particularly through mandates, uh, the, through the CLCPA like I mentioned. Um, there are other benefits of electrification as well as uh, you know climate uh, goals that the state might have and and requirements that we have as you know as a country in the in the the world. But improved air quality is a big one. So health cost benefits have been um, estimated. I'm going to show you a few data points that are from the Solutions Project, was essentially a, a a joint venture that started in Stanford University, included Cornell researchers and others across the country. 
um, and then branched off into something called the Solutions Project. Um, but they came up with roadmaps for every state across the country for electrifying everything. Um, we're talking planes, cars, trucks, everything, um, rather than on fossil fuels. The avoided health costs are are quite staggering. $22.34 billion, this is annually 1.23% um, of the state's GDP on health cost benefits. A lot of this is asthma, um, improved air quality, that sort of thing. There are also lower energy costs overall. So it's it's hard to make the case for everyone who's on gas right now, the the financial case of transitioning over to all electric and heat pumps, in particular for heating homes. So the, the savings are modest across the state, about $112 per person um, in energy cost savings. But again, if you factor in the, the um, health and climate costs, they're quite a bit more. And this is per person per year. Um, so what I take from this is that it's not more expensive, which is really the, the bottom line. We're, we're actually saving money by making this transition. Also, good quality careers. They did an analysis that showed 40-year jobs created. So these are jobs that people keep. So I wouldn't even call these jobs, but careers. You know, somebody who's in a, in a career for 40 years, this is not a, you know, summer job or a building job when solar's going in and then it's over. These are construction jobs um, that, that last, um, uh, again, uh, you know, 175,000 almost, and operation jobs of about 94,500 um, created through the transition to clean electricity. Um, so these are you know, uh, some additional benefits of this transition. It's, it's going to be costly, but overall it's going to benefit. Um, back to Janelle. <laughs> sure. So yeah, as, as Guillermo kind of highlights, I think the, the benefits of electrification um, are immense and, and have the potential to positively impact the lives of all community members. So I think, you know, now I'll talk a little bit about from the utility perspective, how we're looking at addressing some of those challenges that I had mentioned, the challenges around um, infrastructure, um, innovation and integration. So addressing that first challenge, the infrastructure challenge can be really complex. Um, from a utility perspective, infrastructure projects are challenging because they're extremely time consuming and costly. Part of that is related to you know, issues like supply chain shortages that a lot of businesses have faced. But you know, thinking more broadly, large scale infrastructure projects um, take place within the utility regulatory environment in New York State. So these projects need to be built into avant grids and NYSEGs, various rate cases with the PSC in New York State, for example. And these kinds of rate cases, they only occur every two to three years. They often take 11 months to settle and they outline the rate of return allowed for utilities on the infrastructure that they will be constructing. So in the ongoing rate case um, happening right now, Avangrid has requested um, $1.3 billion for capital expenditures to be spent between 2022 and 2026 on transmission and distribution projects associated with meeting New York's um, ambitious goals from the CLCPA. So just to, to be a little bit more specific, um, there are currently 23 large scale transmission projects planned across NYSEG's service territory, particularly in the Binghamton, Ithaca, uh, Lancaster, Lockport and Oneonta divisions. Um, I'm gonna focus on Ithaca a little bit. I know there's people from across the state I probably should have said this at the beginning, but my work um, supports Ithaca in particular around pilots and demonstrations supporting Ithaca's Green New Deal goals. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about Ithaca because I, I tend to know the most about what's going on in Ithaca. Um, so drilling down a little bit further, 
um, the Ithaca Green New Deal and its electrification goals will require significant infrastructure investments and upgrades. As buildings electrify, winter electric loads in Ithaca are expected to ultimately triple. So that puts a real strain on the transmission and distribution systems. So the projects that are planned are gonna proceed in two phases. So the first is gonna upgrade the transmission, transmission and distribution network between the Coddington and Etna substations. Then in the second phase, um, five projects are going to replace multiple transformers at the West Hill and South Hill substations with larger transformers to increase capacity. Um, there'll be a new distribution circuit created coming out of East Ithaca, and there'll be upgrades to 7.2 miles of lines tied to the Coddington substation. So taken together, the goal of these projects is to significantly increase the capacity of the transmission and distribution systems in the Ithaca area to support clean energy and also improve the resilience um, and reliability of that network. If we could go to the next slide, please. But those infrastructure upgrades alone, they won't get us all the way to the CLCPA goals. Um, as that legislation has outlined, and you know, as I kind of talked about a little bit, there's a real gap between what our existing clean energy technologies can do and what will be needed to meet the goals of the CLCPA. So that brings me to talk a little bit more about my group at Avant Grid. Um, as I said, we're the Smart Grids Innovation and Planning Group, and our goal really is to champion the development of grid modernization by collaborating with external groups to identify, support, and prove the scalability of innovative technologies that allow for better integration of clean energy resources. And so I just wanted to talk a little bit about a couple of those projects. So one exciting um, pilot that's getting underway, um, it's the Switched Source tie controller project. So Switched Source is the company and they'll be installing a device that they have designed between two substations. So between the East Ithaca and South Hill substations. And what this device is going to do, it's really cool. It allows for bi-directional flow of power so this has a couple of benefits. So it in increases reliability. Um, it lowers outage times because you can shift the load between the circuits. Um, if one circuit is having a problem and the other one is fine, you can shift that load pretty easily. But more importantly for um, what we're talking about, it allows the circuits to share their distributed energy resources. So the things that are coming off like solar panels. So if one of the circuits has a lot of generation, too much generation for that circuit, it can be shifted over to the circuit with the lower um, concentration of distributed energy resources. Um, so that's really exciting. You know, it gives grid operators more flexibility and it circumvents the need for those costly and time consuming infrastructure upgrades that I had talked about. Um, another project, another pilot is the flexible interconnection pilots. So this program addresses, you know, an ongoing struggle for utilities, and that's the backlog of distributed energy resources that are trying to interconnect. Um, so this will roll out um, flexible interconnection software. So without that um, software, there are technical constraints um, that we've talked a little bit about when integrating um, clean energy onto the grid. So those are around things like voltage regulation, thermal loading, and power quality. And as we've talked about, those vary, those constraints vary based on time, location, and other distributed energy resources on that system. And taken together, these constraints are called the hosting capacity of that system. So, you know, as I'm sure you can see, these constraints, they really leave the utility with two options: either limit the scale of distributed energy resources coming onto the system so that it remains below the hosting capacity or make those infrastructure improvements to raise that capacity. So, you know, obviously that first solution is not satisfactory to customers who want to interconnect projects. 
nor should it be. And the second, those infrastructure upgrades can be time consuming and expensive. So this pilot project is you know, exciting because this flexible interconnection software, it allows dynamic um, control of those energy resources and fail to save curtailment to manage those operational constraints. So the proof that this type of software works on the system is essential to opening the grid through the rapid increase in distributed energy resources seeking to interconnect. And then looking at things from, from the customer perspective, an important um, project for customers and their ability to engage with energy efficiency is the rollout of smart meters. Um, smart meters are gonna be rolled out for all 1.8 million NYSEG customers in the coming years. Rollout began in Ithaca in November, 2022 with 35,000 meters installed to date. And these smart meters allow customers to see their energy usage in real time eliminating the need for estimated meter reads, which I know will make a lot of customers, including myself, <laughs> very happy. Um, this empowers customers to make energy efficiency choices based on their real-time energy usage. And if we can go to the next slide, please. So I have just two more quick examples of some pilots that we have going on. Um, we have the geothermal district pilot ongoing. Um, this project demonstrates the efficiency of heating and cooling buildings by using electricity to leverage thermal resources in the ground. And this reduces energy consumption and operating costs for consumers. Um, but as Anne mentioned, it, it also helps the grid because it reduces the increase in peak electric load. And the last thing that I'll talk about, um, Guillermo had mentioned he's a little bit, it's our distributed energy storage pilots. So this demonstration is going to select some distribution feeders in Ithaca that require upgrade due to lack of capacity, um, require upgrade due to electrification under decarbonization initiatives, and or require upgrades due to economic growth. So this project will engage with residential and commercial customers to install battery storage systems at their location and to balance the load profile of the distribution feeder with those battery systems. Um, as Guillermo had mentioned, energy storage is a promising technology to pair with distributed energy. Um, it will be set essential to the future of creating a smarter grid. And again, you know, just to sum up this part for me, there's a, a lot of work to do to build the infrastructure, um, develop those innovative technologies and to integrate those distributed resources onto the grid. And you know, I know it will be a challenging and frustrating process. I'm, I'm pretty excited to, to be a part of the group at Avangrid working to, to kind of achieve that. So I don't know if anyone, anyone had any questions about that or if um, Guillermo wants to talk a little bit more, I think about the challenges individual space as that clean energy future emerges. Any questions? We'll go to Guillermo. That's fine, so we can go on then. Um, so really, it goes back to Anne. So oh, okay. what's to be done? Yeah, well, Janelle talked about um, the challenges of um, infrastructure and innovation and integration. I want to talk about what's in it for us as humans trying to deal with this grid. Um, what's, what's, what's to be done? So there are five challenges uh, for people and some thoughts about how you can get involved in the solution to these challenges. The first one, Janelle mentioned that the grid doesn't have the capacity to supply all the electricity that we're calling for with electrification. So going all electric is not enough. We need to seriously reduce the demand as individuals and also as whole communities. So where, where are we gonna reduce the demand? Where, what are the options? Um, it's not in, enough to encourage, is it, is it enough to encourage people to take voluntary actions to like use less energy? Is that gonna do it for us? Um, we also need to take collective action and, and push our governments to change policies uh, to reduce energy use collectively. Um, if we don't, then we're likely gonna see 
uh, blackouts and brownouts because there's not enough electricity to meet our, our increasing electrical demands. So one of the challenges to decreasing um, our own personal electric demands is uh, upgrading our homes. As you can see from the diagram, um, typ typically homes leak cold air into the lower part of the house uh, in the wintertime uh, through cracks and windows that aren't closed all the way and little holes and in the basement and around, um, you know, around the windows. And that cold air comes in and we use our electricity to, if we have a heat pump, to heat it up. And what happens to hot air when it gets hot? Hot air rises. <laughs> it's like, was that sophomore of high school or so? You know? um, so hot air rises and then there are holes and, and cracks and leaks up in the upper part of the house and the warm air just goes right out. And basically when the warm air leaves, it creates a vacuum and it pulls new cold air in at the bottom of the house. And then we spend more electricity heating that air up and then that air goes up and out and then that creates a vacuum and that pulls in more cold. And we basically end up warming the backyard um, and continually heating fresh cold air all winter long. So the way to solve that is to seal up all the cracks and holes. Uh, it's called air sealing. And to increase the insulation because heat also escapes, escapes out through the roof and through the walls if there's insufficient insulation. But um, both of these things are really expensive if your house is old, especially. But even houses built in the 70s or 80s have air leaks and insufficient insulation. So we need to increase the insulation. We need to seal up the air leaks. Um, and that work should be done first before you install your new heating system, before you install your heat pumps. Um, because if your house is really efficient and well sealed and insulated, you're gonna need a smaller system and it's gonna be cheaper for you. It's gonna make more sense to have a smaller system because you're not continually heating up the cold air that's, that's being pulled into the house. Um, so that's the first challenge is how are we gonna, how are we gonna reduce our energy use? Um, so the next challenge is equity. And that's about people who can afford it are going to go for the heat pumps and go for the heat pump water heaters and insulate their home and seal up the cracks. Um, but what about the people who can't afford it? And if lower income households can't participate, we will never be able to meet our goals. We have to ensure that everybody can up, upgrade their home and switch off of gas um, in order to meet the CLCPA goals. How are we gonna do that? How are we gonna make it affordable for everybody? What's the solution to that? And even um, EVs, if, if we can't drive gas cars anymore and everyone's driving electric vehicles calling for even more, who can afford an EV and who isn't gonna be able to? Can we make EVs affordable for everybody or can we um, increase public transit so that people don't need to have their own cars? So that's the second challenge is equity and how to solve that problem. The third challenge, the next challenge is rental properties. Rents are going up and up and up and up. And um, if the landlord upgrades the home by air sealing and insulating and puts in heat pumps, that landlord's gonna be tempted to raise the rent, which will make it unaffordable for most people. Over 73, 75% of homes in the city of Ithaca are rental properties. We have to figure this out. It's a huge challenge. People are gonna be forced out of their homes and move into the rural areas surrounding Ithaca. Um, but even those rents are going up, a 24% increase over last year in the town of Dryden. 
because Ithaca people are moving out of Ithaca because the taxes and the rent is too high. So what are we going to do to make it work for rental properties? The other problem besides landlords raising the rent is that most renters, most tenants pay for their electricity, but they don't pay for their heat. Um, if there is a, are four apart apartments in one building, the landlord's going to pay the heat you know, and heat the whole building, but the tenant is going to have their own electric meter. But now the heat is going to be switched to electric. So all of a sudden the tenants are paying for the heat on their electric bill. The landlord's not paying for heat anymore. Will the rent go down? What do you think? So that's another problem with the rental properties is that um, the costs are going to go up for tenants one way or another. What's to be done? And the last uh, challenge that I want to talk about is the workforce. Um, as Guillermo mentioned, we're going to need hundreds and hundreds of jobs of people installing heat pumps and insulating and air sealing homes. We have 6,000 buildings in the city of Ithaca. Think about how many jobs that is to do all of the upgrades and all of the installations. That's a lot of work. So who's gonna take that work? Well, this is a perfect opportunity um, to reduce poverty in Tompkins County by recruiting and training low-income people for these good green careers. Um, how do we make sure that everybody who wants a job can get one? How do we do the, the outreach? There's free job training right now in Ithaca for insulation, air sealing, and heat pump installation. Um, how do we make sure that the people who need those jobs can get those jobs? Otherwise, people are going to come in from other places around the state who already have the skills and take the money right out of the county. So here's an opportunity for us to really resolve some of the equity issues and raise income levels for low income people. Um, how do we make sure that we recruit enough people to take these green careers? So those are the challenges. Um, we have our work cut out for us as a community to figure out how to make this transition work and how to make it work for everyone and how to pay for it. Um, and nobody's gonna do this but us. We're gonna have to figure this out. And we're gonna have to talk to our council people and our state reps and everyone in between and tell them what we want and what we need and urge them to do the right thing. So there'll be some time for you to ask some questions afterwards if you want about um, how to get engaged in these kinds of challenges, and I'd be happy to answer them, unless you have something right now that you'd like to ask. One came into the chat, Don, I didn't see what it was. Yeah, it's asking about the efficiency of pump storage, which is you know, not exactly what you're talking about right now, but we can answer it. because Yeah, that yeah. Before. So I brought up pump storage um, and I don't, have any idea what the efficiency of pump storage is? The the it's in pretty it's pretty good. Yeah, the point is that basically you're using the electricity when you don't need it, so it's excess electricity generally, or cheaper electricity, and then you release it or you create power when it's most needed. So uh, again, I I don't think. I don't know. I don't know what the efficiency is, but it takes advantage of excess electricity, and that's the point. Yeah, I think pumps can be pretty efficient, and you know, if you run a, essentially, if you run a turbine backwards, it's a pump. So, um, so I, I believe I believe efficiency is quite high, but I don't know numbers for sure. Mm -hmm. I just want to emphasize that. Um, to meet these challenges, we have to think more than just um, of ourselves as individuals in our own homes. We have to really collectively get together and talk with people and come up with things that we believe need to happen and then push for them to happen. Um, 
it's if we just focus on one home at a time, one individual at a time, it'll take us the next 80 years to get it done. We've got to ramp up. We've got to ramp up the scale. We've got to uh, increase the speed. Um, we don't have 80 years to solve this problem. So um, I'm really encouraging everybody to get active in terms of um, collectively figuring out how to move this move this forward. Agreed. Uh, likewise. So um, just a couple more slides that we have and a couple more of the informational things, and then we're definitely welcome to be open it up. Um, so and sort of, I don't know if you wanted to wrap up with, you know, what's to be done. That's it. Okay. That's it. <laughs> um, incentive opportunities. So this feeds in. Janelle will take this on. Uh, you know, there are some incentives available for people to, to do this trans transition. Yeah, sure. So I'll just run through these. I'll try to be try to be pretty quick with these because it's a lot of information. Um, so on this slide, these are some uh, programs, rebates that are available at the state level. Um, so like things like the clean heat rebates. So that's a couple of different rebates through NYSEG and our G&E um, for customers to replace their furnaces, boilers, um, water heaters with eligible heat pump equipment. Um, for those that live in apartment buildings or multifamily homes, um, the multifamily energy efficiency program, that's incentives for the installation of energy efficient equipment um, and also includes no cost energy assessments as well. Um, when it comes to things like electric vehicles, um, NYSEG has the EV time of use rate. So that allows customers to adjust their charging schedules to take advantage of rate savings um, on their monthly bill. And there's also things like the clean rebates for electric cars. So that's up to $2,000 for electric vehicles. And lastly, um, Empower New York, that provides um, no cost energy efficiency solutions for income eligible New Yorkers. So that includes a, a range of things from home energy assessments to the installation of high efficiency lighting, attic and wall insulation, replacement of inefficient appliances, and also um, monthly credits on bills. And if we could go to the next slide. And now that the Inflation Reduction Act has been passed, there are more programs and tax credits coming from the federal level. So the clean vehicle credit, um, that's up to $7,500 for a qualified EV, for a qualified new EV, and up to $4,000 for the purchase of a qualifying um, used car. And there's also, you know, again, charging equipment that's a rebate of up to $1,000 for um, qualified residential stuff. And then there's a couple other tax credits through the IRA. Um, there's one that's up to $2,000 for heat pump equipment another that provides a 30% rebate for our solar installation, battery storage for heat pumps. And one that looks pretty promising, the high efficiency um, electric home rebate program. So this is point of sale consumer discounts for lower moderate income households to electrify their homes. And it looks like it's up to um, 14,000 for income qualifying households. The details of a lot of these, the, especially the federal ones from the IRA, are still emerging, but I, I think they look pretty exciting. If anyone has any questions about those. Yeah, I have a question on the um, EV time of use uh, credit. Mm -hmm. um, can you say just a little bit more about that and if that's in place already or if that's coming or? Yeah, that, that is in place. Yes. So that is something that customers with EVs can opt into. Yes. So um, I gather you need a uh, smart meter for that. Is that right? Well, you can. We since we're installing smart meters throughout the service territory, those will be best for it. Um, but it it does uh, it can be used with the meters as they exist now. Mm -hmm. It is like uh, it does exist in in households now. So how do I how do I get on that? <laughs> Sure. Yeah, you can do that on our website. Um, I can send you some information. Uh, I'm actually want. a National Grid customer. And, yeah. Oh, okay. I'm sure they have something similar. Yeah, I'm sure they do. Yeah. Other questions?
All right, just uh, a little bit more, just some additional programs then. Um, through NYSERDA, there's the Clean Energy Hubs, some of you may have heard about. Um, these are pretty comprehensive groups that are by um, economic development region across the states. So there's 10 of those across the state. And um, here I just gave contact information for our local Tompkins County person, but you can look up yours um, at NYSERDA, you know, Clean Energy Hub, essentially. And there's a there's a hub for everyone across the state. And these essentially are your one-stop shop for all your energy questions. That's what they're intended to be. Um, so they combine NYSERDA incentives, NYSEG incentives, some local incentives from foundations and things, religious organizations that might have you know, repairs for homes through um, for low-income um, community members. And so they should be, they're, they're just getting ramped up, but they should be knowledgeable about what's available for you to upgrade your home, electrify, and they do focus on low and moderate income community members. So really on those programs that particularly help disadvantaged communities and low income community members. Um, NYSEG, Janelle's described a bunch of programs. In addition to that, just one that's local here again to the Ithaca area, just north of Ithaca, there's a town called Lansing. And within that area, um, there's a moratorium, a gas moratorium. Um, there's also one over in Westchester County um, through Con Ed, I believe, that um, essentially there's... Um, Growth uh, outstripped um, what was available in terms of gas supply. And so um, rather than bringing in more gas through a pipeline, which was the traditional sort of solution, there is a uh, there was a long process to propose different projects that, would, that were collectively called the non-pipes alternatives. And the idea is to lower gas use overall in the community, so it it allows for greater reliability in that community without issues um, and without bringing in more gas. So you can learn more about that. We are leading a, an education program around that as part of six other projects that, um, that are in the whole alternatives program. And you can see information about that here. Uh, Block Power is a local, well, it's a, it's a New York City based group that, um, has been hired locally by the city of Ithaca and the town of Ithaca is working on a contract perhaps um, to implement the electrification part of the Ithaca Green New Deal. So it's been kicked around um, in this conversation a few times. The Ithaca Green New Deal has various elements, including building elect electrification um, as well as other things. Um, there's a strong uh, social justice component that's really important, um, including workforce development. Um, but as far as the electrification of buildings, Block Power was hired to run that program. And so if you're interested and in the Ithaca, city of Ithaca area, um, then you can uh, look into that program here. And then we're just available for answering general questions. So that's my contact information there. You're always welcome to reach out to me or Anne. And uh, Janelle has graciously put her information here as well, if you have direct questions for her. Um, I think that's all we have. Yes, that's all we have. Um, I'll leave that up for a little bit. But um, now we open it up to, we've asked Don to lead kind of a moderated discussion. But absolutely, if folks have any kind of questions um, that you've been wondering about, we veered off focusing on the grid to some extent because of electrification overall is really what we're talking about here. Um, but any questions folks have for any of us? Grid's got a hand up, and so does Eva. We'll start with the grid and then go to Eva. Yeah, so I had a question about some of these large scale efforts that Janelle was talking about, like you know, building new infrastructure across the state or um, technology innovations. Um, I was wondering if you could talk about the economics of that and specifically how is that being paid for? And are there are there some aspects of grid transitions that are that for-profit companies see as money makers and so they're eager to be involved with? And are there other aspects which are 
maybe not really money makers. So maybe public funds would have to go to those. And just talk, could you just talk about some of those sort of economic issues? Yeah, sure. So for NYSEG and Avangrid, so for you know our two companies in New York State, NYSEG and RG&E, um, really the way that that infrastructure is built and paid for is through our rate cases. So our rate cases are done with the Public Service Commission um, in collaboration. And those rate cases um, set the rate of return that the company, so how much money they'll be able to make from the investments that they're making into their infrastructure. Um, and so when the Public Service Commission and the company with the input of the public agree on what's in that document, um, that's how we get to, that's how we decide what we're gonna build, um, how it's gonna be paid for, um, and you know in what timeline it's gonna be done on. So really it's a, a regulatory process. Um, that decides what the profitability of um, like the, the infrastructure will be, if that makes sense. Um, as far as which technologies are money makers versus which aren't, I mean, at least in my group, the, the perspective is more which technologies can we pilot, put into pilots and demonstrations to try and prove the scalability of. That's really the, the main question that my group is interested in. Um, more so like if we can prove that we can use this flexible interconnection software in the Ithaca division, that's what we're looking for to then try and integrate that throughout um, our service territory. So cost and like investment is certainly a component of that, but the main concern is, will this be scalable to other parts of the state? So I hope that answers that a little bit. Yes, thank you. Sure. And Eva had a question. Yes. My big concern in all of this is to avoid waste of all kinds. And I don't feel there is enough emphasis on that. I understand, uh, and I missed the beginning of the program, I'm sorry to say, but I understand that in tightening up houses to make them more uh, less wasteful, so the heat doesn't escape. There are all kinds of other things, it seems to me, that we can do in the way we live in the houses and we live in the world in general. And I would like to see much more education about practical things we can do as individuals to waste less. Uh, you know, things like uh, one thing that I see all the time is if people are boiling water to make themselves a cup of tea, they'll boil the full, con the full um, kettle, which takes, of course, much more energy than if you just put in enough water to make a cup or two. And it's such an obvious thing, but many people don't think of it. And I think we could all learn a lot uh, about how to avoid waste from tips that people have. And I wish I saw more of it in um, newspapers, for instance, or other ways that people um, get information these days. I don't use social media, but many people do, and that's a good place for it. So that's my one wish for tonight. <laughs> it's so interesting, Eva. I I had a revelation uh, maybe about a year ago. I would walk into a room and flip the light on and go get whatever I wanted and come out and flip the light off. And, I, and then I thought, I know exactly where that towel is. I don't need to turn the light on to grab that towel. I know I, the towel has been there for 10 years. I know where that towel is. So, I mean, they're very tiny things and they require a, a, a raising of consciousness for all of us. Um, I think the transition that we need is going to be less convenient and require more thoughtfulness from all of us. And how we get there, that's a problem because we can't mandate that kind of thing for people. We can't say you must. Um, right. 
when energy gets really expensive, maybe people will adapt new hob, you know, new habits. Um, but there are some community things that have been done. Uh, for example, where you give people feedback, immediate feedback about how much energy they're using, which smart meters should be able to do. But people have to log on and go on the computer. Some public, very visible way yes. of knowing how much energy you're using at any moment would really help because you could see it go up and down. I remember when I first learned to drive a hybrid car and it had a little thing on the dashboard. The green went up, the green went down, and I could see when I was using more gas and when I was using it changed the way I drive. I have never driven the same again. Even when I'm driving a gas powered car, I don't drive the same anymore. So there's a habit that needs to change and giving people information is one way to do it. So how can we get people information about their energy use? You know, we've, Guillermo and I have talked about having a big public thermometer somewhere downtown like the United Way has um, to show it's all red because it's too hot. And then we can see how much less energy people are using and the red goes down and the blue comes over it. And, you know, could we get the kind of data that we need for the whole community to see what kind of energy are we using? How are we doing? We, yay, we did better. Oh shit. What do we do now? You know, like just really getting the feedback somehow. If we can think of some things that would help people know more about how much they're actually using, I think that would help change the habits you're talking about. Yeah. Thank you. Other questions? Marion's got a hand up. Yeah, Janelle, on the distributive storage uh, pilot and, and putting it hopefully into actual practice, um, I'm kind of looking at it in two ways, one for the greater good and one for a personal good. Um, would these be used in part for the greater good to even out the um, production of power when you bring in uh, solar and wind and these alternate sources uh, that the distributive uh, storage could be used for that, number one? And number two, if you had mentioned something about it's possibly being used for individuals use too. I would love that because I would like to have something like that. So I don't have to have a propane powered generator for when the power goes out up here in the Adirondacks <laughs> and it does. So those are my two questions here on distributive storage. Yes. Yeah. I think you, you characterize it absolutely right. Um, as far as for the greater good, the battery storage does allow um, for basically load balancing. So if there's a lot of generation coming, it's very sunny outside, it's the summertime, you know, that energy can go into a battery and hang out till the time, you know, it's winter now or the next day it's rainy. It can then go onto the grid to help meet the demand on that day. And so it kind of, it functions really similarly at the like micro level. So in your house, as it does at the macro level, like for the, for the greater community. So the batteries are good enough now? For a long time, they were not. They're getting better. Yeah. Yeah. They, they, we do have them going into commercial um, and industrial um, locations. And we also have them large scale. Um, so at the grid level, oh, yeah, that technology is advancing pretty quickly. Um, and that's, that's a really exciting area of the business. Thank you very much. Yeah, sure. Thanks for the question. I'll just add that um, the number of solar farms, the utility scale solar, distributed generation of solar, those are required uh, to have battery storage or at least to try to have battery storage um, by new NYSERDA regulations. So any of the large scale solar projects and probably the wind ones as well, although I'm not positive, um, are required to at least seriously consider and try to include storage as part of those projects. So that would mean that you know when we're talking about two megawatts up to 100 megawatts or more um, in one site, 
it's not just feeding the grid when the sun is shining, but it's able to feed the grid, you know, much longer period of the year. Other questions? I've, I've got uh, a technical one, which was not on my, my uh, prompting list, but um, uh, how much uh, electricity is lost over uh, distance and transmission? And I think there's a lot of misconceptions about out there about that, which is part of the reason I asked, but I think you probably know answers better than I do, so. So just a, a sort of general idea of if, you know, if we end up needing to bring, well, we already do bring electricity across long distances. So how much is lost in transmission? That's a good question. I, I know that, you know, it is lost over the, the length of the lines, but I'm not sure like specifically how much and how much it would be comparatively for clean energy. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I would have to look into that for you. I don't know that off the top of my head. Yeah, my understanding is the traditional grid, you get about 30% efficiency. Um, so it's quite low. Um, with distributed to get better, especially if it's, you know, it's at a house level, community level, where you're using the power. Um, but you do lose a lot of the energy through the distribution line. That is true. Other questions? Uh, could I ask on this because I'm truly ignorant? Are our highest power transmission lines, are they direct current or alternating current? And isn't direct current more efficient? So, but I really don't know. I, I'm, I'm asking. Right. All of the transmission is alternating current. It is. OK. Um, yes. Yeah, a lot of the battery storage is direct current. Yes, of course. Mm -hmm. Yep. The issue with direct current is that it can't travel very far. Mm -hmm. It's even less efficient. Yeah. The distance is. Thank you. Sure. Other, Other questions? We're already at 820. Um, you know, we don't want to keep people, but we're happy to keep answering questions. Bryce? Bryce has a question. Yep, go ahead. But you're muted, Bryce. Maybe it's better that way. No, 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 no. I'm sure it's not. <laughs> no, I was going to say, uh, first of all, I used 40% efficiency for power transmission, but that wasn't the main point. Uh, I was going to say that, uh, I mean, I've been, I've been trying to save energy since the 1973 oil embargo. And... Uh, in fact, in a couple of years, we cut our our home consumption of uh, gas by more than fifty percent. But uh, with lots of lots of measures, closing off rooms we don't use, and various things. But anyway, uh, my nephew and I have houses that are very similar, and uh, we have similar heating uh, practices. Um, he has a heat pump. Uh, now, heat pumps were mentioned, although there was not much was said about them. And uh, a few years ago, I thought it would be interesting to compare our energy consumption and uh, costs. And uh, it turned out that it was a wash, his house and ours. We don't have a heat pump. He does. And when I factored in uh, the, uh, uh, the direct costs and so forth, uh, plus, and figuring 40% uh, of forty percent efficiency of power uh, supply on the grid, uh, as I say, it came out to be a, a wash. It came out to be a wash both in terms of energy uh, demand or consumption and uh, cost. In other words, he wasn't either saving money nor energy. And, uh, uh, you know, I'll just throw that out because the, those were the data that... that uh, came up with. Yeah. How, how old is his heat pump? Well, uh, he moved to Syracuse about a little more than 10 years ago. And uh, pretty soon after that, he got a got a heat pump. And the other thing I just mentioned is that if you if you do heat a whole pot of 
water for your tea. That's probably mostly done in cold weather. And uh, anyway, what happens to the heat as the, as the water cools? It goes into, it substitutes for other means of heating your house. So it's not all lost. Yeah. So Bryce, I think uh, the calculations change for people who are heating their homes with oil or propane. We versus... both heat. We, we both heat with gas. With natural we're, gas. They're, they're similar houses built by the same architect. Uh, he has basically one sewing room less than we do. Otherwise, so the, the houses the... are very similar uh, in the same. I mean, he's five houses down the street. You know, they're the same climate and yep. same exposure. But I, what I'm saying is that if if people are heating with heating oil or propane. Um, and then they switch to heat pumps, you'll see a much bigger difference. Well, obviously he doesn't rely, I mean, the, the heat pump is, is an ex, you know, that's an accessory, but uh, uh, I mean, he basically he has gas heat just as we do. Yeah. Yeah, yeah well, as Guillermo said, it's not gonna be cheaper necessarily, but it's not gonna be a lot more expensive either. No, be basically the same. It was it was a wash yeah. in terms of both energy consumption, yeah. figuring forty percent of transmission, uh, you know, efficiency. Yeah, I'll take cost. that. Yeah. Well, that's the the thing that you know. There's there's reasons to get off of fossil fuels that you know it's not about saving money necessarily, but it it has been shown across the sectors that overall will save money. But as Anne's pointing out. Uh, trying to compare it with gas costs, it's it's a very difficult um, comparison to make. And just in terms of it's not going to come out cheaper, probably, for right. most people. Off fossil fuels, uh, I'm sorry, off of fuel oil or propane or electric resistance heating, you will save money, significant amounts of money. So overall, there's modest savings across the whole community. But if you're just trying to transition off gas, um, you know, without factoring in if you have an old system that's dying anyway and you have to replace it, that's the time to make the transition. Um, you know, taking out a, a perfectly good new system may not make sense on a lot of levels, but there are, you know, like we're saying, there is a real need to transition off of fossil fuels and however we can get there, hopefully with more state local federal incentives, it, more people can get there and make it cost effective. No, I wasn't. I wasn't disparaging those sources or the, yeah. that kind of transition. And and I I I, I didn't mean to overemphasize the uh, the cost aspect. That was not why he did it. That mm. was that was an attempt to save energy. And my remember the first part of that. I found that he wasn't saving energy either. Right. Right. It was That's a war. when you the say two, our two, basically we came out even. So he was still using the same amount of gas overall. No, but total. I mean, the, the right. total cost, the total energy consumption, where you figure the the, the electric and the gas. Assuming that the assuming that the electricity again, I'm making assumptions in my calculations. I had to do something. Uh, uh, the, uh, the, the the assuming that gas was what generated the power that was then used, you know, was came through as only forty percent. The rest mm -hmm. of it going out to heat the air. Yeah, and you're probably right. It is closer to 40% efficiency across the grid than 30. Yeah. Um, I was more optimistic than you were. Yeah. <laughs> but um, but that's but there's a good another point. Thing I wanna, another point I want to make, Guillermo, is that as more and more people electrify their homes, Bryce, <laughs> um, the gas infrastructure is going to have to be supported by fewer and fewer customers. So the price of gas is going to go up. Because more the more people that get off gas, mm -hmm. the infrastructure has to remain the same and has to be continually maintained. And that infrastructure will have to be supported by fewer and fewer customers as time goes on. So those prices are going to go up eventually. Yeah. Again, I want to emphasize my comment really wasn't about saving money. It was about saving yeah. energy. Yeah, yeah, I'm curious, um, you know, if we really dug into it, and I don't think, so heat pumps, you know, air source heat pumps are roughly two and a half times, you know, more efficient than, you know, regular resistance electric, which is 100% efficient, and then oil or propane or gas are 
anywhere from 60 to 85, 90% efficient, maybe. So air source heat pumps are able to move energy from one place to another or move heat from one place to another much more efficiently than vegan gas can. Um, that's just sort of physics, but how much of the total use in his house was actually converted over to the heat pumps versus staying on the gas? You know, there, there's a lot of sort of factors that go into it. If he was able to completely convert over to heat pumps, even with gas produced electricity on the grid, it would save energy overall. Um, but if it's just a small, some percentage that he was shifting over to heat pumps, uh, you might not notice that that difference. Yeah. So, um, so I've got a, a fairly new high efficiency furnace, but I've got a fairly old um, uh, uh, air conditioner for the whole house air conditioning, and I'm wondering if um, if I want to get air conditioning should i do that through um zoned heat pumps um instead of uh, replacing the uh, traditional air conditioner well if you're thinking about air source heat pumps um you could install one right. in a room that you really want to have air conditioned and you would have air conditioning in the one or two rooms right near the air source heat pump without having to switch off your whole heating system. And it's especially if it's newer and efficient. We don't have central air. Uh, we have a window air conditioner in the bedroom. And when it gets really hot, just open the bedroom door and let it run. And it, it, it uh, you know, with your yeah. it's pulled where the sun is shining and yeah. uh, windows closed and so forth. All, all yeah. the things that I know to take and uh, you know the house stays quite comfortable even in really hot weather. Yeah, and we use fans a lot. Yeah, me too. To move oh, the air. Yes. Um, we have those too. Very yes. much, and that's mm -hmm. partly because I've got uh, got nice big trees shading the house, so and it's well insulated. We and one yeah. sort of informal study that we did just um, told some folks. We assume that the electrical load will increase when we go to heat pumps from um, heating with oil, propane, gas, um, because you're shifting all of that, obviously, to electric. But what we found is that a lot of people do have these fans, window air conditioners, dehumidifiers, humidifiers in some cases. So we have found actually that some people don't notice much of an overall yearly spike in electricity use because you're not using the fans, you're not using the dehumidifiers, you're not using the window air conditioners anymore, um, which are quite energy intensive. So overall, you have heating and cooling now, and they actually don't notice um, significant increase in an overall electricity. Uh, again, balanced over a whole year, um, which is surprising to me. So, and that's, that's getting off of fossil fuels. So there are some folks who save money that way. Um, not directly off the fuel, but just because they've consolidated everything into heat pumps rather than all these different appliances and systems, some of which are very inefficient. Uh, Marion, I saw your hand up as well. Yes, uh, this is um, kind of off the wall, but it has to do with something Anne said. Um, I very much appreciate your saying one of the things we need to do is to seal the cracks around windows and doors and so on and so forth to make, <clears throat> excuse me, our houses less lossy when it comes to heat, etc. But how do you balance the health problems when you have houses that have been wrapped uh, in addition, and they're doing that more and more these days, wrap them with Tyvek or what have you, again, to cut out the heat loss, the energy loss, um, and that makes them so tight that you don't get enough fresh air in to counteract some of the effects of just being alive. Yeah, many times uh, contractors re uh, suggest that you put a ventilation system in when you really, really tighten up your house um, to put a, a ventilation system in so that there is some air exchange um, but that can get controlled so that you're not 
you're not sending hot air out. Um, so there are ways of controlling the, the temperature of the air that you send out and bring in so that you don't lose that efficiency. But yes, that's definitely a problem. Guillermo, you have more information on that? Yeah, so there's a lot to say about that. And essentially the, the best example that I like to hear uh, that, that I was told when I was a builder is that essentially your house is leaky, um, all houses, new houses, old houses, they're all leaky. Um, you don't notice it. Uh, there's a lot of holes in the walls. There's a lot of holes around the windows, et cetera. Um, and that some people think that that's good. Your house breathes. And that was sort of a traditional way of thinking that it's a, it's important that houses breathe. That's a real fallacy. We don't want our houses to breathe because essentially what's happening is that a mouse created a nest in the insulation in your wall. And that creates, that allows for the easiest airflow right through that mouse nest. So that's what you're breathing, essentially. You don't have any control over where that air comes in. It's going to come in through the easiest access point. And those are often not the cleanest air that you want to breathe. It's it's possibly moldy air. It's mouse nest air. Um, so what you ideally want to do is seal up the house just about as tight as you can make it. And then, like Anne said, introduce clean filtered air uh, into that environment. And that can add cost for sure, but that's going to be the healthiest solution ultimately. So the healthiest and, and for helps, you. It helps control moisture also. Well, that's the other issue that you really need to have somebody who understands the building science to do it right, because there are ways that you can tighten up a home and create problems. Right. Um, so people can find that there are mold issues and right. other issues after tightening up a house too much. Right. So it really has to be done right. Um, but if it's done right, yes, then it can solve a lot of those mold and, and humidity and, and air quality issues. Um, as Anne mentioned, there's something called energy re um, recovery ventilation or heat recovery ventilation that allows you. So in the wintertime, it basically doesn't bring in cold air directly as a fan into the house. It, it has a heat exchanger and circulates that air. So what you're bringing in is cold air. It gets heated up with ambient air before it gets dumped into your house. So it's not just a simple fan you know, there's a lot of technologies that allow for conditioned air to be introduced into a living area. And that, that I think is the important piece that homes are not meant to just breathe sort of, you know, they were built not very tight. And then we just kept introducing bigger and bigger heating systems. And that's why almost everyone's gas, oil, propane, furnaces, boilers are two or three times the size they need to be because homes were just built not shabbily, even good homes, good quality homes were built leaky. And then we just introduced bigger and bigger heating systems because gas was cheap and oil was cheap even way back. Um, and it was just easier, much easier than to make a tight home. It was just easier to bring, bring in a, a really big heating system. Um, and that's still the mentality of a lot of HVAC folks, unfortunately. But, you know, really, if we can tighten up our homes and bring in a small heating and cooling system, we'd all be a lot better off. All right. Well, I have there are more questions on your prompting sheet, but it is uh, we've been at it for over 90 minutes. So I think it's probably time to say. Goodbye. Yeah. Yeah. We can ignore the, the, the prompting sheet for sure. If, I guess if there's any you know last remaining questions, I'm happy to stay on, but um, certainly let people go if if you need to. Um, and I know Don, you probably want to get going. So we'll, we'll wrap it up. Yeah, it's been, yeah, it's been a great session. Thank you all ever so much. And uh, we will resume in September for science in the virtual pub and we can stick around for another question or two if folks want to do that. So feel free to sign off and say good night. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. So. yeah, thank you all. I don't know. I assume people know how to Find science in the virtual pub. I don't know if you want to drop that link in the chat. Um, but it, you're here now, so you you must have found it somehow. Great, great. <laughs> yeah, well, how you do can you always feel? go ahead, Bryce. I was going to say, how do you feel about wrapping? Uh, this was popular a while back. I never liked it. Uh, uh, wrapping your hot water heater. I say again, just like the uh, tea kettle. 
uh, in the summer, of course, it makes a difference. But uh, through most of the heating season, which is almost always in upstate New York, uh, you know, uh, that, that, that heat is just, that substitutes for other sources of heat. Whatever is lost from the uh, hot, hot water heater, which really is not that, the outside of the, our hot water heater isn't much above room temperature. Right. Uh, so if it's a decently insulated water heater, so the, I have two issues with that. Um, one is that I like to call it just a water heater. It's not a hot water heater because, and everyone calls it a hot water heater. Right. You don't heat the but hot if, water. <laughs> <laughs> so that's just me, but uh, water heater. Um, so yeah, yeah, if it's, I mean, they, they're insulated. So if it's a decently insulated water heater, you're probably fine. I agree with you. If it, the, the issue then becomes your basement's not well insulated. Um, so where is your, you know, your kind of blanket around your house and what's your conditioned space? You, you might consider your basement conditioned, but it's, you know, they tend to be pretty leaky. So you think that that heat from the water heater is just heating up your house, but really it's probably just escaping before it ever gets to a useful room. Um, if it's a finished basement and your water heater's right there and you cozy up next to it and you're reading a book, Sure. But if it's just getting wasted before it gets to a usable space, uh, it might be better to wrap it. Um, it's more efficient that way. In our basement. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if it's a, fish in, a finished basement, you know, and you're just, um, but yeah, typically you know, if it's your typical basement, it's probably losing a bunch of its heat before it gets to your living space. Ours isn't typical. <laughs> yeah, but that's the thing, you know, even ovens, you know, you know, Sure. <laughs> if they're vented like you know all of these things your refrigerator your refrigerator you know people don't realize is a heat pump you you know and yeah. and that's you you have hot coils in the back it's taking heat out of the room um i'm sorry heat out of the inside of the refrigerator and dumping it into the room and you know so the rest of your kitchen heats up well in the summertime that's kind of an issue in the winter time it's great um and that's the same thing with heat pumps. If you have a heat pump water heater, it's dumping heat into the room all the time. Um, and people have an issue with that. Sometimes, you know, it's in your conditioned space and in the summertime, it's just adding heat. So we're kind of used to that with refrigerators. We don't realize we've come to accept it with appliances that we're used to. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But anyway. <laughs> um, I will note, yeah. speaking of appliances that we're used to that I... I love my induction range, which I got maybe a year and a half ago or something like that. And it replaced a uh, almond colored electric range to give you an idea of the, the vintage of what it replaced. Um, but I've, I've cooked with gas in, in previous houses and, and missed it, but I don't miss it anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we hear that a lot. Electric... Um, you know, if you just go to straight electric, there's some people who are fine with that. Um, but most people don't like cooking with electric. There's a lot of issues with, you know, the control primarily. You, you really don't have much control over the heat. It goes up slowly. It goes down very slowly. Not particularly safe to, you know, afterwards they stay very hot. Induction has a lot of advantages in that sense. Yeah, um, it boils water faster than on gas stove, the gas stoves I've had anyway. Yeah, and just as much control. You can really just turn it down to exactly where you want it and leave it there. Yep. Yeah, it's really terrific. All right, well, thanks, everyone. I, I don't know if um, I'm ready to let Don go and, and everyone else, uh, <laughs> but I appreciate all your comments and all your time. You can yeah, always you. find Guillermo and I at Cornell Cooperative Extension, Tompkins County. Yeah, and uh, the uh, um, the recording is already available since uh, we're live on YouTube, and you can find it on our YouTube channel there. And just click the live tab. So if it was useful, feel free to share it out to all your friends and neighbors. Yes. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. And thanks, Don and, and Ingrid, for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you.